Good night. Hi, everybody. This is ABM and Complicated Melody, and welcome to the sixth episode of Add Water and Stir, a podcast devoted to promoting um, adoption and foster care in communities of color. And um, I, of course, am ABM, and you'll see our host here, uh, Complicated Melody. Tell people, say hi, girl. What's going hey, on? Hey, everybody. Welcome to our sixth episode. This is Mimi of Complicated Melody, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Woo-woo. So how's it shaking, ABM? What's been going on with you for the last couple of weeks? Well, it's, um, you know, it's kind of been... Uh, Still having a little bit of the blues around here, but we are um, we are managing. I have a new do. I love it. Thank love you. Thank it. you. I uh, got it cut yesterday, and um, this is my hair. I grew it out for two and a half years, and um, that was the longest that my hair had been in probably uh, over ten years maybe closer to 15. Um, I really don't do long hair. And um, I had just kind of gotten to a point this, the beginning of this week, uh, um, I said I needed to exercise, feel like I had some kind of control over something in my life. So I took it out of my hair. It's all wavy and ooh, look like you use juices and berries in there. You know, not that grease that you (laughs) said you put in there last week. That looked like some other stuff, you know. Coconut oil. And some uh, yeah. blue magic. <laughs> Don't stun on my magic. See what a little dab of grease will do for you. <laughs> See, there you go. I'm like, you know, like the kids say, just hook it up with some waves, girl. Waves for days. Um, but you know, we're doing all right. Hope started um, eighth grade uh, this week, and um, it's doing beautifully. And I had to. You know, I've been spending the last couple of days emailing teachers, some teachers that she had last spring, um, kind of giving them a little update, and then introducing um, um, us to new teachers and kind of helping with some of that transition and things that they, I felt like they needed to know about her. And um, you know, it's it's um, eighth grade is a big deal. It's like you're at finally at the top of middle school, so you got some so weird social dynamics going on. Oh, apparently being 13 is so hard. I choose not to remember, but um, being the parent of a 13-year-old is also hard. So tell me <laughs> this. As part of your things that you felt like uh, the teachers need to know, did you talk to them about her being adopted? I did. I did. And, you know, last, um, when she moved here, originally I kind of, I didn't want to tell people. I didn't want to tell a lot of people um, at the school. Um, But when we took a tour, when she came to visit last fall, and then when she started school in um, January, February, um, my girl was just so off the chain, resistant and upset, and it's so different from my other school, and I don't want to be here, and this is just BS. Um, that, in kind of working with the counselors, we had to disclose everything, and it really did help and make the teachers a lot more patient with her um, and um, some of the behavioral change um, issues that we had to deal with last semester. And um, I don't think that those issues will be as big of a deal, but we're actually fine. I'm finding right now that um, our biggest issue is dealing with correction, um, and those things can go two ways. Either there's a complete shutdown where it's like, I am not wrong. I'm right. The the sky is green with purple polka dots. I don't understand why you can't see it. You're dumb. <laughs> and so she shuts down, and, and this kind of need to be right and to have primacy over everything and um, it makes it very difficult to work with her sometimes or she goes to the other end and says oh my god I got it wrong and so I'm bad and when she's bad that is, is some has sometimes meant that she had to move and so then she kind of shuts down that way. And so we're really struggling with how to um, deal with corrective issues regarding behaviors or even just kind of learning new material, which she's like, oh, no, I know what that is. And I'm like, you don't know what it is. <laughs> and it's okay that you don't. You don't have to. Um, but, yeah, she's so, – so that's kind of what we're struggling with. And I felt like the teachers really needed to know that she was struggling with correction and learning, not because she's just being difficult, but because it really means something much deeper to her. Hmm. 
So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll go hope. Hopefully this will be a good eighth grade year for her. So. Yes, yes. Oh, and we do have, you know, of course, you know, of course the very one is gone, but we got J and Bay Crab, um, the Crabbers. J and Bay. Okay. Right. All right. Keeping the uh, the <laughs> Trinity going here with the uh, on the okay. run tour. Yeah, so we got a couple of hermit crabs, um, but Bay didn't make it. She only lasted like about 24 hours, but Jay oh, is still kind of keeping it. <laughs> I don't know, you know. What happened to the grass? I don't know. Within 24 hours, we went to go pick her up and ch check on her and splash a little water on her, and her leg fell off, and it just it just didn't end well for her. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to be here no more. <laughs> you know, the good girl gone bad thing didn't really work out for her, so we will get bathed. Not bathe with one leg gone. No, yeah. one leg. So we will get bathed the second this weekend. We will be replacing her um, and uh, upgrading my boy over here. So, but we're we're doing all right. So tell us what's going on with you. Well, um, I've gotten a lot of nasty grams about not updating my blog in quite some time. Not a lot. Everybody you know. watching is nodding. Uh, <laughs> so I promise. I'm going to say it's on the video that I will update this blog by this weekend and I'll do a little something. I just haven't been in the blogging mood and I really need to learn how to write, write through those moments where you're, you know, you have a lot to say but you don't know how to say it. So I just need to learn how to write through those moments. Um, we actually have a date for our adoption, so I'm excited about that. Um, it's going to be in late September, so we are excited. Um, it's interesting because I'm really hyped about it. I want to have a celebration because, you know, um, and, and people who are going through foster care and adoption experiences, some can relate to this, that you miss out on some of those big milestones. You're not having necessarily the baby showers and you're not having everybody show up and help you with casserole dishes and everything and mm. people showing up at the hospital. So you're missing out on some of those things. So I feel like I want to celebrate something. Like I really yeah. want people to realize like this is a big, um, this is a big deal for us. Yeah. Interestingly, my husband would. It's kind of like, womp, womp, womp. <laughs> you know, she's been with us for six months. So, uh, you know, it's just really a big deal. So, we're still kind of finagling through those issues. We, you know, I'm finessing him, you know. So, I hope to report right. back with some good news about this big celebration we're having. Um, um, you know, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say with, um, you know, the day, your finalization day, there was a, um, it reminded me that today I saw a, an interesting article um, that, um, from a blogger that we've mentioned before, the Red Thread, Red, okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm so Red sorry. Red Thread Broken. Red Thread Broken, yeah, she, um, she has... Um, a new blog post up. I don't know if it's really new or if it's just kind of making the rounds again about what's wrong with gotcha day mm -hmm. and that particular terminology and kind of, you know, talking about um, um, how for some families it's offensive, they prefer family day or um, the child's name day, like so for us it would be hope day or something like that. Um, but but recognizing, and the other thing that was I found interesting about the blog was um, that it was the different days that folks celebrated. So some folks actually celebrated on the day of placement versus the day uh -huh. of finalization and all of these kinds of things. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I'll ha I'm happy to disclose that um, we didn't have a problem with the terminology gotcha day because um, it wasn't a me possessing her. It was a us joining together, we got each other. Um, and I don't know if that you know just worked for us because we're just a twosome. Um, the awesome duo or what, but um, but I certainly understand um, from this particular adoptee's perspective how that particular term might you know rub the wrong way. But um, but in any case, I think that finalization day is is awesome. We celebrated. We celebrated. We had barbecue. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Like we're gonna have a little cook out and have out in the park where the kids can uh, run around and play and have you know it's really about what 
it's going to be fun for her. And I think that I did read that blog about uh, Gotcha Day, and I've read other thoughts about Gotcha Day. Um, for for us, I'm thinking more of this is in a sense like a family anniversary. I look at it not exactly like a marriage, but in some ways, you are really this is the day that you are. Um, legally binding yourself together to each other and this is the day that we actually become a family mm -hmm. so I feel like that's something for us to celebrate and for many people it's on the birthday right mm -hmm. and so there's nothing really maybe there's not a lot of thought put into it. it's just your birthday right but it's also really them joining your family day too and since that doesn't happen on her birthday it's happening on a different day I want to celebrate that um, and She's two, right? She's two and a half, so she really doesn't know. So maybe, you know, I'll continue to keep a pulse out to see how she feels about it as she gets older. But yeah. it sounds like Hope was all for it, so. Yeah, I mean, she thought that it was an interesting, you know, she thought it was a neat colloquialism and, um, you know, but at 13, who knows, she, I'm really open to us just doing something cool on June 6th every year. And for me, it really doesn't matter what we call it. It's not like I'm really going to find a Hallmark card for it on the regular anyway. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> Unless we make some. Here we go. We got a little nut, another thing to do. Make some adoption <laughs> cards with some little black kids on the front. Hey. We're branching out. We home. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> the other thing is that I've been doing I've been trying to uh, treat myself by asking for help so my sister came down for the weekend my mother was here the week before uh, or two weeks before and just enjoying them being around and helping out and, and getting to know Nana so Good. Awesome. Um, and then the other thing I'm thinking about is what's next. So the way my agency works is once you adopt, um, you are out of commission really for a year because they really want you to take that time to bond with your child. Um, if you had decided to foster before you went to adoption placement, you could. But if you didn't, then you need to wait a year. So what else can I do in this meantime? I mean, I'm going to be bonding with Nana, but I want to continue adoption advocacy, right? I want to continue to um, help the community in some way. We're doing that through the podcast, but what can I do right here in my local community? So I'm sure. thinking about the next steps for me. So those are the main things I'm, I've been thinking about for the last couple of weeks. Awesome. Good deal. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because the next step piece I didn't really give a lot of thought to. We've just kind of been taking this out. <laughs> you got your hands full, you know. You you have your hands full. I feel like with a teenager, that's enough. That's your advocacy right here. Like, you know. child is the 14, <laughs> we right. got to through, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, I, it's um, certainly I'm really involved in my agency's um, support group structure and um, and I've got some other families that I've just kind of bonded with as we've gone through the process and so we check in there they one is about to have a plate her placement her child has been coming to visit um, um, really it's been kind of interesting because they could keep coming to do these cross-country visits and I'm like pull the trigger already like like move the kid it's kind of hard um, you know when you go back and forth um, but um, I check on I check on a few folks, and that's pretty much all I can handle. And it's funny because I end up always talking to them on nanny night. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, during your downtime, that's when you chat. Yeah, I'm like this is for you. Like the wine in a good pajama night, right? Well, it has turned into the the I can't booze at the federal park because I'm like I'm on, like on the banks of the river. I got my takeout. I bring a lawn chair. I got a blanket, and I'm by my dang self. And I know people are looking at me like, really? Is there some like, other things going? Is the music out there? Like, what's happening? Oh, no, it's quiet. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's quiet. And I go off to the side. I don't want any bugs. No duck. No nothing. It's just just leave me alone. And so. Um, and so that's been kind of uh, uh, 
thwarted each time. I have um, I have a midweek nanny nanny night. Uh, either it's a Tuesday or a Thursday, and then we have nanny nights on Friday or Saturday. So kind of got that on the books now, and so I have two days a week where I can kind of just check out. And so far, those couple of nights have been sucked up by <laughs> family. So I feel like I'm doing my part. <laughs> ooh ooh ooh! I think one day we need to do a podcast on how your budget has changed since you brought a child into your life because that nanny night I know is not free you know so it is not, uh, it is not free and once we get these uh, CPS up out of our <laughs> our business we can actually start using uh, babysitting services oh right yeah so I'm looking forward to that because me and Wood can have some date nights you gotta I'm have thinking about it nanny night is really important to me and I made a financial commitment through for the next couple of months, which on the we know what the dates are and that's it and um, you know, but it is a big financial commitment. But I am like throwing the money at the nanny, running out the <laughs> like. <laughs> you gotta catch like, I got a special, I got a special <laughs> just for you. Right, I'm throwing the money like and just like making it rain in the living room. I gotta go. So <laughs> I haven't bought new shoes or new clothes in three months, but I'm going on nanny. But I'm going night. to nanny night though. I might be going to McDonald's, but I'm going to nanny night. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to mention that the chat is open, um, so you can, because uh, we already starting to get crunk in the uh, <laughs> podcast already, but um, you can. Uh, Put some questions or comments or things that you want us to talk about um, in yes. the in the chat or the Q and A uh, piece of it. Yes. So why don't we go ahead and get into our topic? This is kind of a special episode that we've been kicking around for a couple of weeks, and and um, Mimi and I have struggled a little bit with this topic and how we wanted to talk about it, what we wanted to say. Things were so emotional. Um, but this episode is called What's Going On, and um, we want to talk a bit about um, current events and kind of what's gone on recently in Ferguson, Missouri, with um, the death of Michael, 18-year-old Michael Brown. And we want to talk about raising kids of color, power and privilege, um, and what our real hopes and fears and dreams are for our kids um, as people of color and African-Americans in our case specifically, um, but really kind of thinking about what happened there and, and how that affects um, or should affect all parents in the way that we think about um, um, rearing our kids. And so um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And um, I've got a bunch more articles. And, you know, I don't know if, uh, Mimi, if you want to kind of give some of your really broad stroke thoughts about um, what happened in Ferguson and, and kind of what's been happening nationally in this discussion about um, children of color um, and um, and what our value, what value is placed on our children and, um, and, and what are our responsibilities in raising them? So um, it's a good question and it's it's really one of the reasons why I've been so silent on my blog. Um, I've really had a hard time in the last three weeks or so, even the last month, dealing with kind of the onslaught of issues pertaining to raising black children. And that's why if you go to my blog right now, you'll see a poem called I'm Raising Children here. And it talks about I'm, I'm raising children, I'm not raising pigs to be slaughtered, I'm raising, you know, I'm not just um, doing what I do just for these children to be cut down in the prime of their life and that's really what the poem is about and that's really what I've been feeling um, that I, it just has felt like an onslaught of, of just and then part of it's because of the media so I think we need to talk about really how media has changed how we consume all this information right so there was a time before where a situation like this would happen in Missouri, um, in St. Louis, and maybe just the St. Louisans would hear about it. So we wouldn't necessarily know about all this. But now you hear about the issue in Missouri, and then you hear about an issue in Florida, and then you hear about an issue in Michigan, and you hear about issues in Chicago. And it feels so overwhelming that I had to actually step back. And I was like, if it's not ratchet, I don't want to talk about it. Because I just felt like... <laughs> 
I, I felt like you. I couldn't deal with it. I just felt like I couldn't deal with it. And I think the addition of a child to our life has um, changed the way we look at it so differently because now that I have a child, I'm like, that could be my child. You know, before it was like, that could be me, but now I'm older, so I maybe don't identify as closely. But now I'm like, that's my child, or that's my child's friend, or that's the child that my friend is walking to school with, or that's the child my, that's the child that my child is in the car with when they get pulled over. So all these things are kind of been an onslaught to me, and I've just had to pull back a little bit to say, how do I kind of manage those emotions. What about you? How have you been kind of feeling these last couple weeks? Well, I um, I did write a little bit more specifically about um, what I was thinking at the time in a, in a post that I called talking about Ferguson and, and um, you know, things kind of jumped off in Ferguson right around the time that we lost the furry one. So it was kind of in a really weird space anyway and it just kind of um, for a few days right after um, the murder, and I and I mean, and I'm I'm gonna own that word. I, that's what I think it was of of this 18 year old kid. You know, it was it took me a couple of days to kind of pop my head up from my little gopher hole and say, holy moly, like there's been a lot going on, and and um, and we watch a lot of Disney Channel, so we kind of avoided it in terms of just talking about it, Hope and I, and then finally I kind of really was watching it coverage at, like, at night and in the office and kind of really thinking about it, and it just really hurt me to my heart because I just remember um, Trayvon Martin, and um, last year some of the conversations that Hope and I had, and um, and even just this spring, and, and one night, you know, she just said, why is it okay to kill black boys? And I really wasn't sure how to answer that, and um, and I think a lot about um, what do I have to teach her to survive. First, there's survival, and I mean you can't get to thriving until you're surviving. And so um, you know I, I really have watched her over the last month, and and um, because she's an older kid, she has this kind of understanding of the world that she is really good at articulating and um, she doesn't trust the police at all. She finds that they're a part of the system um, and so she, um, you know, I don't know how she would even react if there was some type of law enforcement confrontation because she has such strong um, um, views on, on uh, law enforcement and what would that mean for her in a country where we shoot first and ask questions later. Um, and even if she isn't there, I also think about um, folks on the outskirts of the actual event um, who become a part of the narrative, like Gentile Rachel and the Trayvon Martin case and how, I mean, the media just dragged this young woman, this young girl, and, you know, she, they asked her just really inappropriate questions and just it was just a really tough thing to watch this young girl go through but um, you know she was made of steel and I just remember seeing her on Pierce Bronson and she just took that man toe to toe mm -hmm. and and I thought well how then if I have to raise this young black girl into a young black woman what do I need to teach her so that she's strong like that but that she's also able um, to navigate systems in, in a way that will keep her safe? How do I help her navigate um, not just kind of institutionalized systems, but informal social systems as well? And, and so I've given a lot of thought to that. And I don't, you know, I, I know how my parents raised me and I'm trying to do that, with, but, but we don't share 13 years of history. Right. So, so it's kind of tough. I think, and the, I think the interesting part about it is it starts even now, you know, I'm thinking about those issues now. Um, Nana is only two, but um, when we talk about teaching her how to survive, like teaching your child how to survive, um, and also understanding how the world is going to see her, you know, they're already, they're going to see her as a threat. And I think that is unfortunate that that's 
a world that I'm raising a child in? And how do I manage her self-esteem and her, um, I want to I want her to be optimistic. I want her to feel like she is beautiful and kind and smart and she has the possibilities to do all that. And then I have to teach her this duality that yes, you are all of that, but people might see you differently. And it starts even now. So even now I think about things like um, is she in the daycare? And will she be given the grace and the patience if she's going through a developmental phase? So if she's going through a phase where she's fighting or tantruming or biting or whatever, will they give her the grace to kind of go through that? Or will they automatically look at her because she is a young black girl as either developmentally challenged or um, aggressive or any of that, even as a two-year-old. Yeah. And it seems abnormal to think about things like that, but I have friends who have experiences where their child has gotten kicked out of daycare mm -hmm. after one incident. And and we wonder, like, is it, what's the reason? And the bad thing is you're always having to think about, is that the reason? So I'm already thinking about things like that here, and she's only two. And those are the things I'm thinking about now because how she's tracked now is going to affect her future. So if she's tracked into the slow class or the aggressive class or the angry class or the disabled class or any of those classes, um, that's going to affect, you know, where she, what her outcome is going to be in the future. Yeah. And I think it's it's really important to talk about um, privilege um, and the different kinds of privilege in, in, in light of this because, um, you know, I, the folks in Ferguson, um, I mean, that is a, it is not an affluent community. And um, so when you layer issues of race um, onto issues of lack of affluence or poor, um, you know, economic marginalization or poverty, then things just kind of get worse and you see a lot less grace. Right. And, um, you know, and I, I see even just the privilege that is afforded me and Hope. You know, we've had some in incidents where, you know, transitions are incredibly difficult for her as they are for a lot of um, foster and adoptive kids. And, you know, she goes, there have been a couple times where she's gone off on folks. And yeah, on the first incident, they were like, you got to go. I can't deal with that. And then I have to show up and I have to play this position <laughs> of, you know, upwardly mobile, <laughs> safe black person. <laughs> right. Right. You know, to kind of smooth things over. Um, and and so then it's kind of, you know, I, I wrestle with um, not only kind of how they see her, what they think of me, how what responsibilities do I have in terms of helping her, you know, deal with transitions better and just improve overall behavior, but also um, learn how to code switch and play a new position that she has never played in a life that is incredibly new to her. And um, and code switching is um, an incredibly big part of that. I agree with that, that code switching is a big part of it. Um, the other thing that when you talk about privilege and class too is because of Nana's environment, will she have the ability to code switch? Will she, how do I teach her Right? This, can you still hear me? Yep. Okay. How do I teach her, because where we live, you know, the system and the way she kind of interacts with the world, everybody is a friend, right? So the police to her are probably happy people who police our neighborhood and wave at her, you know, <laughs> because that's the neighborhood we live in. But as she gets older and she... Yeah expands her network of friends and she's on the other side of town <laughs> you know at her friend's house yeah. that may not be the case because the and just like you talked about in Ferguson when you talk about the economics um, of the situation and where she's at they may not interact with her in a friendly manner that way and yeah. will she have that kind of um, what we call as a uh, common sense or street smarts or whatever to be able to understand this how you're going to act over here and this how you're going to and am, am I going to be able to give her that because 
we're not hanging out over there like that anymore. I'm concerned. Like, these are things, and I'm like, she is only two. And these are things that I'm thinking about all the time. That's a lot of stress if you think about this compounding over time, right? You're in the middle of it because you have a 12-year-old, 13-year-old right now. So you're right in the throes of those conversations where you are um, giving permission to go out and hang out and do things with groups of people and in places where you're not there to help police the situation, right? Or you're not yeah. there to help help her yeah. navigate through the situations. To yeah. me, it just feels so scary right now. Well, yeah, it's funny because you, you said, wow, I'm thinking about this while she's two, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I don't have a lot of time to teach her the essential things that she needs to know. <laughs> I don't have a lot of time. Um, but, you know, there was a, there, I think that, that one of the things that folks really have to come to grips with, and, and I deal with this in my, in my day job, but also um, with other friends and colleagues that I engage with, is that we have a huge population that really just doesn't believe that race matters anymore. Um, racism is dead. We have a black president. We're in post-racial times. It's, you know, we're good. We're groovy. And, um, you know, I had a Facebook discussion because I don't like to call it a <laughs> fight because it wasn't a fight. But, you know, someone kind of engaged me. And usually I don't do the, the I don't do the social media kind of, um, um, engagement on on issues of race too much because I just it's exhausting um, and you kind of can go around in circles but someone just told me that my perception of the world was just not factually based um, and in terms of my own experience in walking around in the skin for 41 years and I took this person to the woodshed like I did it politely but I took him to the woodshed <laughs> And drag him around, and and you know, and I, I talked about going to a recent professional meeting where you know only a couple of hundred black people are there, and I'm a national figure, and they still call me by somebody else's name, and I have a name tag on. How the TSA searched my hair going and go, going to that destination and yes. coming back to that destination. How I at some airports, Indianapolis, I'm talking about you. I just go ahead and put my hair back, or just find find some way of conforming because they just search my hair the whole every time I go there. You know, and I talk about some of these things. And I talk about the things that I lay awake at night worrying about hope um, and what do I need to teach her to survive and how do I teach her not to be so angry um, and, and how do I teach her not to retaliate in a way that isn't um, really worthy of her grace that she can actually have for herself and mm -hmm. and um, and it's and it's these are things that kind of keep me up at night but I also recognize that for a lot of other uh, um, you know I think that certainly let, let's just say parents of all kids no matter what color or background they're from lay awake at night worrying about their kids right I genuinely believe that um, and you know, we, we I wanted to mention um, certainly talk a little bit about transracial adoption. I want kids to have homes, so you know I'd, I'd love to see more people of color adopting. Um, I'm, and certainly I'd love to see them adopting kids of color. But I, but adopt whomever you want. <laughs> Right. I mean, the situation is that, you know, we have a lot of children of color that are yeah. in the system and they need homes and they need loving parents. And so, yeah. and so, you know, there are a number of blogs that I've read where, you know, some families, transracial families, adopted families, you know, where the parents were white and the kids were um, African American or uh, some other um, racial background different from their parents, said, oh, it doesn't really matter. Um, it really just doesn't matter. And, um, and, and it and I just have to say, for me, I don't know how responsible that is. I'm not saying that they're bad parents, but I think that it just kind of sets some kids up for some real issues that are legitimate racial identity issues later. And um, and so there were some great articles that I came across. Um, one, there's a there's a really great video. It's about eight minutes long. I'm not going to show it, but we'll put it in the show notes um, that Don Lemon did on CNN last month. Um, with a panel about raising African American males in the current environment and, and how do we value their lives and and those types of things, but there are some other some some really great um, um, 
things on HuffPost. There was an article last um, that was published last year called Raising Culturally Responsive Black Children in White Adoptive Homes, Uncovering the Importance of Code Switching in the Battlefield of Racial Identity Development. And um, it was really a good, um, um, thoughtful essay about, um, you know, how do white parents teach their children of color how to negotiate white spaces um, and um, and how do they kind of navigate some of these things and where do they find resources um, because as much as some folks say that they want a colorblind society we don't live in one. I think that's important because um, you know I think there is I think there are a lot of uh, transracial families that are trying their best, right? That are looking up resources, looking, um, getting into conversations and trying to find um, ways to educate their children. But then there are also uh, families who are like, you know, we're a colorblind family. That's how we raise them. And I feel like Ferguson, and uh, even before Ferguson, I mean, there's so many things that we can identify. Trayvon Martin and all these kind of incidents should be in, in, a, in a way an indicator that there's something happening if you have a black child or you have a, another child of another um, different than you, a minority, that there are some things that you may be missing in the conversation. Like it's not always um, just because the person committed a crime or it's just not always just happenstance that perhaps you know there are biases walking around and we really need to address that. Um, and until those parents can be okay with admitting that, it's going to be hard for them to even kind of start to have those conversations with their children or look out um, for opportunities for them to find out more about those issues. So I guess one of the things I think that's good about this podcast is that we're talking about the issue. We're raising it. So um, maybe in a way we can be a resource to these are some of the issues that we're thinking about as um, parents of African-American children and so if you have African-American children <laughs> these might be issues that may be pertinent to you too um, so just something to think about yeah I mean you know but I, I, and I'll take it actually one step further whether you have African-American kids or not you need to be talking to your kids about race Absolutely. Um, and, and, and not for the purposes of actually creating some kind of separatism or separatist movement, but really kind of talking about the social constructs of race and how those things operate in society so that you can make sure that you're raising culturally conscious and culturally um, um, aware kids um, and that different isn't, isn't always bad. Different can be a beautiful thing. Um, and um, I want to shout out Serial Adopter. I had um, on my announcement for the tonight's podcast. Hey, Serial Adopter. Um, we love her. Um, but she sent in a, um, a comment. And for a future podcast, I'll actually have this box where you can kind of send me some comments and, and we can talk about them on the show. But I wanted to kind of take a moment to, to read her comments. She is um, with a trans, she is a transracial adoptive family mom. Um, and she writes, love that you're going to talk about this. As you know, we are a transracial adoptive family. And we often talk about race, much to the chagrin of some of my white friends. We had a long conversation about Michael Brown, just as we had a conversation conversation about Trayvon. It's an ongoing process. I grew up in the 60s and walked with my parents in civil rights marches, had black foster sisters while growing up, etc. So these discussions aren't new, aren't new due to our current family makeup. However, it's a whole different conversation when you think of your black son who is already impulsive due to early trauma and such and knowing that no matter what we tell, teach him, his impulsivity might get the best of him and who knows what might happen. Thanks for approaching the subject. I'll be anxious to watch the podcast. Hi. Um, but, you know, she actually raises um, a, a piece of it that we hadn't thought about, or at least I did kind of touch a little bit on um, with respect to Hope and, and her distrust for law enforcement and and um, some things that she struggles with in terms of impulsivity, um, that these are things that may make our children, um, and especially our children of color, but all of our adoptive children, um, more at risk for, right. um, you know, at risk for um, a potential 
negative outcome that may be based or rooted in an overreaction, um, you know, kind of um, an over or excessive use of force, when really there's kind of a whole backstory to understanding what brought this kid to this particular moment. Um, and so I'm glad that she, she brought that up, but it's something that I think that we all need to talk to our kids about um, in, in my own in my day, day job, I do a lot of teaching, and I'm, I'm always stunned to find how um, my white students are like, oh, well, you know, I don't have a racial identity. I mean, I'm white, and I'm, I'm just white. And I'm like, but, but, but that is a racial identity. <laughs> like, we need to do some right. development. And that I, is <laughs> right. And, and it is identity, yes. Yeah, and, it's, and, and kind of understanding what that means um, and socially. And, I mean, it is a social construct in this country. And, and um, uh, if you're interested in doing some kind of reading about um, race as a social construct, there's some really great articles. Um, and if you're interested in doing some provocative reading about race um, and race relations, um, to Tanihisi Coates um, from The Atlantic is a prolific writer um, on this subject. And um, yes. I guess scoot on over to The Atlantic. He's also on Twitter, and he will blow your mind. Um, and um, he is fearless in his writing about the subject and um, and really will make you sit up and take pause and, and, and think about um, what kinds of conversations we should be having with our families. You know, interestingly enough, Angela Tucker, who has the uh, blog, um, Angela Tucker, who has the blog, um, what is it, The Adopted Life? She's a yeah. transracial adoptee. She's an African-American uh, woman who was raised uh, by um, white adoptive parents. So she writes on her blog, and actually I think this is posted at the Lost Daughters, um, about the responsibility of transracial families in uh, raising and talking about these issues with their um, children. And one of the things that she says is, you know, how will white adoptive parents teach lessons of safety to their growing black sons? How will they teach it that it's okay for some people to trash talk during a spirited football game, but not then? Um, and she, she goes on to kind of highlight some other things that um, I guess are very maybe relevant to even her experiences growing up as a transracial adoptee. So I think there's also space in this conversation for those who have Absolutely. actually grown up in the con grown up in these situations and now are old enough to really speak on the experience and maybe how their um, adoptive parents help them and then also ways that they could have um, done more to help them be prepared for the world that they really have to um, live in now. So Absolutely. that's another um, resource. Yes, um, so if you're, um, if you're uh, any kind of adoptive family and you have some comments on this, please um, hit us up on Twitter or um, email us or um, use the form. I know I have a podcast page on my blog um, and there's a form there as well that you can kind of fill out and send it to us and we will, um, I'm sure that we will be revisiting this topic. Yes, we will. <laughs> over and over and over again. Um, we're going to post um, in the show notes in a couple of days a number of articles that I've pulled and um, there's all kinds of interesting things. Madame, Madame Noir's website has a, um, um, some interesting um, stuff, those kinds of articles like where to raise, where's the best places to raise African-American families, which you know um, I think is, is important just to be mindful of that these are things that um, maybe have social structures or, um, or um, additional support systems for different kinds of families. Um, there's a, um, a site that I found that had the worst state um, to raise um, black kids. Um, sadly, that state was Wisconsin. It's a really kind of challenging article to read, but, um, but um, Virginia, which is where I am, didn't actually do too bad. I mean, we're like in the top, like, you know, we're, we're above the median, so I was kind of Well, that's good for y'all. That's good. good. I don't even want to ask about my state. I don't even want to say anything about it. I don't even look it up. Actually, you guys were only a couple of rungs down from us. I think you were still above the median, well above the median. So, um, but, um, so we'll post some that of that That is stuff. surprising. 
Okay. So we'll post some of that stuff um, there as well. And so we it is uh, almost quarter to 11, so we're going to start transitioning to, dun, 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 thanks to Future Adopter, the wind down. <laughs> <laughs> and I had my wine today. Do you have some wine today? <laughs> I'm not drinking wine, but I do have some Baileys. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so you know, I'm, I've got my own, um, you know, little lighter fluid over here that I'm working on. Um, I had to be a little careful. I had a big allergy thing and had to load up on some Benadryl, so I had to kind of wait for some of that to clear the system a little bit. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been. <laughs> you got me knocked out after this podcast. <laughs> So um, tonight we're going to talk about a couple of our our favorite shows again, um, and we will start with the most ratchet, mm -mm. <laughs> and Hip Hop Atlanta, the reunion shows. Oh, MG, these fools! <laughs> just... I, you know what? It just continues to reach the newest level of low. Just when you like, okay, this this is the worst. It just continues to get into the words, and then you just feel like the word no longer has any meaning. That's how yeah. it's going. It's just, you know, it's funny because the reunion, they have these, like, they have all of these shows, these reality shows. And so, you know, first it was like, okay, we're going to do the reunion. And then the reunions became two parts. And now they're like three parts. And, you know, so they've shown the first two episodes of the reunion um, for Love and Hip Hop Atlanta. And the second episode just turned into an all-out melee between Jocelyn, uh, Stevie, Stevie J, Benzino, and is she his wife yet? I don't know. Yes, yes. You're talking about uh, Thi or whatever that chick's <laughs> name is. I don't know. He's got a tattoo all along his torso. Oh, that man, I mean, that looks just... awful, but you know, <laughs> tell him to keep his shirt on. Who told him to take it off on television? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, um, it was just too much. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> this is the, this is the deal bad. about that situation. You know, I'm an advocate of keeping your hands to yourself. You're right. So <laughs> all that fighting is just very extra. But I'm definitely not a fan of now all of y'all sitting here acting like y'all had nothing to do with the situation. <laughs> you know, so now everybody is sitting back. Um, what do they call it? Tuesday night quarterback and what is it? I, I don't know that the, the you know, <laughs> is it that's that how it goes? My husband will be so mad at me. But so uh, who wasn't watching the game before she came <laughs> <laughs> Today he was like, you know it's kickoff tonight. I'm like, oh, okay. But anyway, um everybody's sitting back, you know, I think Jocelyn really has a problem with drugs. Like most of those people on that stage probably have more than a casual relationship with uh, with some kind of illicit, illicit substance. substance. So, <laughs> I don't understand why everybody there is acting like, you know, she's the only one with the problem. Uh, as though they haven't been talking crap on Twitter, as though they haven't been, you know, saying crazy stuff back and forth. So now everybody's like, I really think she has a problem. What are you talking about? Yeah, I, it, it's funny. I mean, you know, they... I just love to hate this show. I really do. I just I do. I love to hate it. And like I didn't get a chance to watch it um, live on Monday night. So I think I was watching it on Tuesday during the day while I was telecommuting. And I'm texting, <laughs> texting me, be like, "What are they doing on this show? <laughs> what is happening? Like, there's ponytails flying, shoes going. I mean, they just kind of bum rush the stage, and, and I mean, it's just. But I did think that was Tammy's real hair, so I was surprised. I was like, oh, okay. Oh. You ain't got that, you know, Hawaiian silky that I thought you had. <laughs> Okay. I mean, it was long because I mean, the bun that she had up under it was pretty significant, but still, like, it was a whole mane of. <laughs> it was a whole horse's tail, like, of hair that was just being slung around. And I mean, and then Mama Waka, Waka Flocka is jumping into the fray. I was like, we are just too old for this foolishness. I just. Uh, I don't know. I feel, I feel Mama Flocka Waka Flame, whatever her name <laughs> is, you know, Deb. Deb. I don't want to say her name because. You know. She might come after us. <laughs> but anyway. And I'm not ready. I'm not ready, I'm not ready but I'm not ready I think this. she's a very sweet woman. I think she yeah. has a good heart. You know, I think I think I tweeted that, you know, she probably had barbecues at her house and you know, I think she I think she I don't want to be Deb's friend. 
too. I want to be a dead friend for a couple of reasons. For the food that she probably cooks, but also for the protection she provides. <laughs> so I understand what she said. Look, that's not what I do, but if it comes to me, I'll get down with it. Right. So right. I, I, I get where she's coming from, yeah. you know. She was like, that's my daughter-in-law. We can't do all of this. So I want, I want just, my mother-in-law to go hard for me, too. So Yes. I am, you know, I'm, I was feeling dead. But, yeah, that foolishness will conclude next week um, with some um, post-Melee interviews with the... I don't know if I'm interested. <laughs> Well, Honestly, I'll be here like, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> I'll be there to report the good, bad, and ugly because okay. it's just <laughs> I'll it's, depend on your. It report. really is like watching a train wreck, and and you're just rubbernecking for an entire hour. It's sad. It's so sad. Maybe one day we can talk about the the effects of reality TV on our brains, really, because I mean I look at it for entertainment. But I do think that it has a negative effect on our kids because they think that that's how you're supposed to interact with people. Like when you oh, get yeah. mad at them, you're supposed to fight them. Like what? I really try to restrict um, uh, uh, Hope's consumption of reality TV to next to nothing. Uh, <laughs> it's bad. And I'm also, not only am I concerned about it just dumbing us down and making us impulsive, but it really, as much as I tune in and I know I'm a part of the problem, so y'all can just be upset. But it does bother me how women in general and women of color act a damn fool on the day on on all of these shows. I mean, well, men of color acting a fool too because I promise yes. you, uh, I'm sure Scrappy hit that woman. Um, yes, and they blacked that out. Yes, and then that fight and that Stevie J. Wait a yes. minute. So let me let yes. me do say this. Did you see how? Um, What's his name? Jocelyn and Stevie J both got up at the same time and bum yes. the place. I mean, they just came flying, stalking across the stage. I mean, in in some ways, I, I mean, I don't condone it, but it was kind of like a beautiful thing to see. What are you doing? <laughs> like, like, but are you ever gonna see Jay Z like, and Beyonce and go stalking across the stage like that? <laughs> I got your back, whatever you do. And she got up, he got up too, and they both went for it. And I was went like, ah. Ride or die. Like, would, would you be there right next to me if I decided I was going to do that? Oh, I'm going to tell you what. Ellie Who is going to be like, no. You're going to be still sitting there. He's going to be like, come on. I'm going to be grabbing you and making you sit back down on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down on the couch. Sit down on the couch. But yeah, so um, and we are at the next to the last episode of um, Married at First Sight. And I, I can't deal with these wanted... people no more. No, no, no. <laughs> these people. Uh, I didn't even get to live tweet. I felt bad, you know. Monet, I, I am. I missed you. I missed chatting with you this week on Twitter. So. She seemed to finally kind of get it together a little bit, but I got really mad at her last night, and I, I didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing last night, so I watched the rest of it today, but but I had to say, I did tweet her and say, girl, I need you to just cook this man a hot dog or something. Like, for real, it is not that serious. I need you to not... The feminist movement is not going to die if you don't cook this man like a hot dog. I really need you to chill. <laughs> so, not... so here's the point. You cannot ask for a traditional man and then turn around and then say you're chauvinistic. I mean, you can say that, but then it feels disingenuous, right? So what does it mean? <laughs> what you say? It's, it doesn't feel disingenuous. It is disingenuous. What does it mean when you say traditional? So you expect him to pay the bills, take out the trash and all these other things. But then when he turns around like, okay, cool. But then you cook. And then you're like, but you're a sharpness pig. I'm like, right. what? <laughs> Girl. I mean, I don't want to feel for Vaughn. Because every time he's like, so if I really want you to cook dinner for me, that's like a problem. Like, like she's like, well, no, if you want me to, that's not a problem. But if you expect me to, that's chauvinistic. I was like, girl, bye. Like, I need you to go fix this man a damn hot dog and, like, be quiet. <laughs> Monet, I, I don't know. I don't know. They, they, they're in trouble. They For their romantic gifts, they gave each other watches. What? I mean, and you clearly they don't have watch. friends. I get, clearly. Call, I get a watch from work. Clearly they don't have well, cold anniversary. Cause, cause, what is it? You're never supposed to buy a man a watch or some shoes? Is that, isn't that how it like, oh. 
time will fly and you'll walk out of your life with some craziness. I don't know. Some wives tale from way back in the day. But I saw that you gave each other watches and I was like, this is not going to end well. They this both nice gave watch. each other watches and that to me is a very nice gift. Yeah. Like personal gift. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. it's very easy to shop for a watch. Like, you don't have to put a lot of thought into it. It's like buying them a wallet. To the Macy's, you could have yeah. just bought, bought them a wallet. That would have just been just as easy. You just know? one of the Velcro joints. I mean, it's just, I just don't get them. I mean, and I was, I root, I was rooting for them, but I'm really also tired of the, the counselor guy going, they are so compatible. I know it doesn't seem like it, but they are. Stop. No, these people are not compatible. They're no. not. Because they and 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 Monet was self reflective in what she said. That when I asked for these certain things, I didn't really think about what it meant if I asked for a guy that had these traits, then he's also gonna have some other traits <laughs> that may not align with me. I can't ask for a traditional guy and then I wanna be a non traditional woman. Right. It just right won't um, mesh up together and I think that's from the very beginning that's really what the issues that they've yeah. been having. And I mean you know it's funny because I'm gonna have to I need to tweet her my personal philosophy on this and that is that you know this notion of partnership and even this traditional notion of, of relationships and, eve, and and submission which is a dirty word um, especially dirty word in the feminist movement it is a choice and I had this conversation with my daddy uh, a couple, of, like almost ten years ago, when I had this moment of revelation in terms of thinking about what I wanted in a in a partner and and being traditional. And I was like, I realized that that I have a choice to to willingly submit to this relationship and and playing certain roles and and some of them may be more traditional than others, but that is a choice. And choices are can be acts of power. <clears throat> And and so, you know, if she doesn't want to cook and she can't cook, that's that's one thing. And if but then she needs to understand how that's gonna work in her situation. But I'm just tired of like that being held up as her paragon of feminism, like this damn cooking thing. I'm like tired of hearing about it every day all week. Fix him a hot dog or go down to the corner store and go get him a hot dog some other street meat and like get over it. <laughs> the mama said, I don't know about the hot dog. We don't eat y'all dogs over here, you know, because we bougie. <laughs> but um, the mama it's said, <laughs> <laughs> the mama, <laughs> bougie and ratchet at the same time. But uh, the mama said, you know, you need to rub on him a little bit. <laughs> you know, you need to make him feel like you like him. So, yeah. you know. I don't know. You're losing. Yeah, she's losing. Both of y'all losing. Vaughn's losing too. I know. But him and his you know. civil conversation. We didn't even talk about that. The fact that he said, I like it when we're being civil to each other. Monet said, I, I was team Monet civil. right there. I was going to team. Everybody deserves more than civil. Civil is what you do with your co workers that you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Not your husband. Right. What's yeah. civil? All right. Civil means. You're heading to the divorce court. Like, I mean, just, like, yeah, it was not, it was a very poor, poor choice of words. I will say that this this week's episode seemed to focus more on the guy's emotional thing, um, their emotional needs. And I found that to be pretty interesting because I don't think that um, we talk about that in, in our culture very much about kind of what men's emotional needs are and, and how they get hurt and how they express it or don't express it, um, how they have fears and you know, you know, I thought it was interesting when Vaughn was like, okay, but we didn't been on TV and like if we get divorced, we gotta tell every person that comes into our life, like, especially because we've been on TV. Like like we gotta Well, tell I think he needs to think about we have been on TV and if you guys get a divorce, everybody is like, We understand. So I think <laughs> think that he needs to realize that too. Now Doug and Jamie, I don't know that well, first of all, Courtney and Jason or whatever Every time they come over, I'm like, "Is it time? Let me go get a snack or something." Like, I can't, I can't deal with it. They're so happy. Their worst problem is he's going to like fire camp or whatever it is. But but I'm like, for a month, <laughs> get over it, girl. Y'all supposed to be married for a life. Like, if we, I don't know how we're gonna make it through his fire training. School. And he's like, thirty I think it's days, like six, girl. Six, no, I think it's like six months. But really, I mean. 
<laughs> I'm about to say 30. Well, even if it's six months. Girl, stop it. <laughs> I'm like, he bought you a t-shirt that had your, day, your wedding day on it and keep calm and then like his little last name. I thought it was That adorable. was cute, though. It was real cute. And I was like, y'all are going to be okay. Like, but I like Doug it. and Jamie. Hmm. I, you know, I, I have been thumbs down for Jamie from the beginning because she is passive aggressive. She is mean. She is just... She needs to go to counseling on her own and resolve her issues before she tries to bring her craziness into other people's lives. How did she get past? How did she get past the screening process? Because she really has some issues. She really has some issues, and I feel sorry for her because I think that this this stuff has made her face those issues. Um, But you know, I kind of feel the same way about her as I do kind of Monet with the, can't you just fix him some something to eat real quick? I'm like, this man needed a cigarette. Why? Because you got on his damn nerves. That's why he needed a cigarette. <laughs> he was stressed. You stressed him out. Like, he you wasn't not smoking before. Him he needed to release some way. <laughs> I was like, he, he laying up, he's spooning beside you because you want to be cuddly now. Because you like him now. And now he's still not giving him none. Poor baby. <laughs> and I'm like, this man just smoked one cigarette in a month. Like, and you must have really put, like, you didn't put him on the couch and in the house. I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> he looked so sad laying on the couch. <laughs> and when. <laughs> he was too tall for that little divan. Like, oh, he's going to push down. It was just pitiful. It was just pitiful. And I was just like, he is a good guy. And he wants to stay with her. But I also fear that he might have broken bird, bird, broken bird syndrome. Now tell me what that is. Broken bird syndrome is um, the really, really nice guy who sees the the broken the broken bird, this really vulnerable young woman, and their intentions are good. Don't get me wrong, and they and he may save her, but but they really have this kind of I can save her. She's so broken. I want to take the little baby out of the nest and like you know I'm the abominable snowman and I will rub her and hook her and feed her and take care of her. You know. So <laughs> in our terminology, we call that a cat. Right, <laughs> so, he's trying to save somebody. You know, y- yes. <laughs> okay. So, so, but yeah, I think that he. Let me translate for you. <laughs> right. So yeah, I think that he he's a captain, and um, and and I don't know, maybe that's what he needs. But captains oftentimes get hurt because they can't save mm-hmm. that person. Right. They cannot save that person. She needs to go get some help. Um, I'm I'm really concerned that they let her go through the screening process. And like I was like, y'all, I mean, she's got some serious issues. So um, they let her go through the screening process because she knows how reality TV works. She makes right. good TV. That's right. what it is. Right. And sadly, they needed a demographic from the trailer. Because everybody else seems to. I mean, you got one. You got one family that is like. Um, what is it? The the little cutesy couple. Neither one parent is about to die, and the other parent ain't come to the wedding, and they just on their own doing it, you know, mm-hmm. doing it. And them, you know, Von and Monet's parents are like, we need y'all to get y'all stuff together. Y'all are cute, <laughs> make it work. And, and Doug's family seems happy, well adjusted. They were like, we don't know about this girl side eye. Uh-huh. And then her family is just a cluster, you know what? And so, <laughs> you know, it's it to be happy, like, girl, you made it. <laughs> You better take that, dude. <laughs> they were like, kids, call him Uncle Doug. And she was like, I don't know about Uncle Doug. No, he's Uncle Doug. Like, he's, we need him to stay. <laughs> he's the best thing that ever happened to his family. So, you know, it's just, yeah, she makes for good TV. She makes for good TV. It's a narrative. So, anyway, it is 11.03. Do we have any recommendations for tonight? I do have some recommendations. Do you have some? I really don't. Except okay, for Benadryl, good. buy it, but if you are allergic to ragweed, it is ragweed season. Knock yourself out at Costco with the knockoff brand of Benadryl. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and that's your recommendation. That's recommendation. That's, recommendation. <laughs> that's, that, that's that Bailey's kicking in. Okay. <laughs> so, so the first recommendation I have is my real recommendation. I got two tonight. So the first is uh, the writings of Stacia L. Brown. Um, she is like an amazing writer. I first came in uh, contact with her writing on postbougie.com, postbougie.com, um, and she was a contributing writer there. And um, I first started reading her when she um, found out she was pregnant with her daughter, mm. and 
her writings are haunting. They're um, they make you feel. They're everything that I think good writing is. Mm. And she wrote five essays related to Michael Brown and the Ferguson um, um, issue. And um, I think those essays are really touching. They're poignant. So I, I recommend that you go and read that. So we'll put a link to that in our show notes so you can go awesome. check her out. Um, but I do have a restaurant recommendation. Love <laughs> those. <laughs> yes. So let me show you what I got. Oh, boy. On our trip to the corner store. <laughs> it is called, can you see these? They are, are called the ch Cheetos Flaming Hot Popcorn. So you may be familiar with the Cheetos yes. Hot. See? Exactly. Yes. You may be familiar with the Cheetos hot flaming like uh, Cheetos and things like that but this is popcorn let me tell you something about this popcorn this popcorn <laughs> has like an underlying flavor of cheese and then they put the hotness on top of it it is delicious it is tasty and look it's only a dollar forty nine and again these are things that you can only find in your neighborhood corner store you cannot find this probably at the um, Kroger's. You can't find this at the Hobby. <laughs> you might not even find this at the Piggly Wiggly. So you need to go to the bodega, the corner store, the convenience store, you know, and get whatever you some. Whatever they call it in your hood. Yeah, whatever um, they call it. The Cheetos Popcorn Fun Hot. Now let me also clarify. So my sister, so actually my sister is the one who, um, who found this for our family, you know, because I feel like this is a legend now. And <laughs> <laughs> when she opened a bag in the car and we started eating it and we're like wow this is tasty we need to get some more so we stopped at another convenience store and she went in and she came out with Cheetos um, flaming hot uh, pop, pop puffs or something mm -mm, not the same thing <laughs> It looks similar, but it's not the same thing. They're like the little fat Cheetos. Like the, you know, the those. fat Cheetos, yeah, yeah. No, not the same thing. The popcorn is what you want to get. It needs to say popcorn on it. Okay, so that's my recommendation. There you go. Awesome. I still haven't found the bacon sunflower seeds. I found other flavors, and I just, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, dang, I should have ordered some off of Amazon today because I still have not. Get your Amazon Prime to work in. I know. It's I, like, you know, it's about to come due today, um, come due this month, too, to renew, but... But uh, I, I gotta, I gotta get me some. I gotta get. Well, some. future a doctor said she had some and they were delicious. So um, she did so on your recommendation. My recommendations are on point. You need to try these flaming hot popcorn. So future adopter, you have an assignment now to go out and find me and report so back. Let it be known that uh, Mimi of Complicated Melody has the best corner store apparently ever. <laughs> Apparently, I live in just just a neighborhood that is just like just. I gotta go find a neighborhood. I gotta go find a different kind. Like <sighs> apparently, we don't have enough of a particular demographic. No, it's a field trip. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> field I gotta trip. drive around. <laughs> All right, so where can they find you? So we can wrap this up. Where can they find you, ABM? And well, you can find me at Adopted Black Mom Word, .com. You can find me on Twitter at Adopted Black Mom and uh, email Adopted Black Mom at gmail.com. Mimi, where can they find you in the E Streets? They can find me on the WordPress at Complicated Melody with an I dot WordPress dot com. You can find me on the Twitters at Mimi Complex at, yeah, yeah, at Mimi Complex. <laughs> and you can email me at it's the wine. Wine, it's the wine yeah. down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can find me on Gmail at complicated melody with an I at gmail.com. And I like to like uh, tell everybody that we are now on iTunes. Yes. Yay. So you can search for us yes. at Water on Store. Add Water and Stir on iTunes. You can look for us under adoption. It's you know. We we're using the keywords. We're All trying to do our Yes, 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 yes. Awesome. We we're on the come up. Yes, we trying to do trying they, to make this a big things. Don't nobody steal our card idea. <laughs> <laughs> Which oh yeah, right. Our, our new Hallmark division. Our minority <laughs> communities of color adoption uh, cards. <laughs> right. 
I'm about to do it right now. So family. All right. We will see everyone in two weeks. Thanks for joining us and uh, peep us on our podcast page or Google Hangout. Thanks so much. All right. See you in two weeks.